Okay, um, so we'll get started. So I think everybody should be able to see the results of the poll that I've just run. Uh, the, so um, for 13 of you have said that you're not familiar with the carpentry approach and four of you said you are familiar with the carpentry approach. No response from five people who might be getting their tea or coffee. Um, if you are here and you haven't responded yet to the poll, uh, you can still do so. Uh, it's a good opportunity to check that you can use the poll, uh, which we will use a couple of times today. So uh, welcome everyone. My name is Arno Pruma um, and I'm based at EPCC at the University of Edinburgh. I'm part of the Archer2 uh, team and involved in Archer2 training. Uh, with me is Nathan Manal, uh, who a colleague of mine at EPCC, similarly involved in, in Archer2, uh, who will be assisting uh, this morning with um, with uh, any questions that, that uh, I can't directly answer, or I don't notice, or if anybody has any issues with uh, with Python setup. I guess, yeah, just drop me a message if you need anything. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, the, the, the thing about these courses is always uh, the preparation. So as you, as you know, uh, some courses, so some Archer 2 courses, people use Archer 2. For this course, it makes sense to have people, you know, use your, your individual, machine your own laptop and as the email instructions were already describing uh you need to have python set up uh on your on your laptop so hopefully everybody has indeed installed python installed uh necessary packages which come automatically if you do the uh default uh, big uh, anaconda install as described in the in the setup notes uh for today mostly what we'll need is uh is uh, pandas numpy um map.lib, um, I think plot nine, which is a little extra, probably will be tomorrow. Um, so don't worry if you haven't got that installed yet. But yeah, as we start out, and if you have any issues, and then uh, Nathan might be able to to, to help, uh, might, be, might, might need to take, take your site into a breakout room if necessary, possibly to solve if it's a particularly difficult issue with getting your setup installed. And as you'll see, as, as we go along, um, there shouldn't be any issue with sort of catching up later. Because as you've seen the course materials, the course materials are quite complete, so they describe uh, both explanations and quite detailed uh, steps about what you would enter into um, the uh, the terminal um, or however you are running Python. It could be a Jupyter notebook. Um, so yeah, if if you have to take a break, if you have to step away, whether it's to fix your Python installation or any other, any other reason, don't worry. Um, you should be able to to look at the the materials and catch up. So before I go any further and ask people to uh, to maybe introduce uh, yourselves, uh, I wanted to share uh, that we have um, a, a sort of a virtual whiteboard, um, which will come in useful at some point, no doubt. So I will put a link in the chat. So um, this is uh, a link to um, a so-called um, Etherpad or Hackpad, I think it's called, yeah, Etherpad. It used to be called Hackpad at some point, which is just a virtual whiteboard space uh, where at some points I might ask you to, if you have, you know, um, some, you could, you could put down issues. I might put down some notes there, things that commands that people can copy paste because, you know, you put things in the chat, but sometimes, you know, if the chat progresses, then things get lost. And this is nice. This is, this pers will persist after the session for a while anyway, if you keep the link to find stuff back. Um, and if people want to, um, yeah, sometimes there might be questions sort of with, with an open-ended question that people can put information in there. I put the uh, schedule as well for today in, in the Etherpad. Um, as you know, um, it's in the email. It's also on the website, on the Archer2 website. So, um, so with that, uh, <clears throat> before we go any further, um, I'm going to suggest that this is kind of the traditional thing during the, during the carpentry's approach. I'll explain the carpentry's approach in a minute um, after we have introductions. The traditional thing is for people to very briefly just introduce themselves in turn, um, saying you know where you're based and basically what you're what you're looking to get out of the course, where you you know how what kind of work you're doing, looking to do with Python or already doing with Python. Um, so we'll, we'll do this uh, alphabetically according to uh, your listing within the list of participants, which if you haven't used Collaborate before, there's a little purple button at the right bottom corner to open your Collaborate panel. Then once you've opened the Collaborate panel, 
there's a few buttons at the bottom, uh, one of which is the one to get the chat, which I hope you found to find the Etherpad link. Then there's a list of participants. Um, so I'm going to stop the poll. And I'm going to, this is also good practice for uh, just seeing if you can unmute yourself at the bottom of this bottom of the screen centrally and, and speak because at any point, if you want to ask questions today, uh, you can either just put a question into the chat or I'm very happy for you to use the um, raise your hand function, which is also at the bottom of the screen centrally. And then hopefully I'll notice, I think I get a little sound and then you can unmute and just ask your question if you prefer just asking it uh, by voice rather than typing. But this is a good opportunity to practice unmuting. So I'll shut up for a minute and uh, let people introduce themselves um, very briefly. So do we want to start with uh, Alba? Are you happy to start? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what do you want me to say? Just hi or? Oh, just very briefly say where you're based and yeah, what you're, what you're looking to, okay. use, to use Python for or wanting to, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm based at uh, University of Barcelona and Univer uh, Durham University, both a uh, collaboration project. I'm a PhD student. And I'm working on human population genomics uh, past. So with ancient DNA at the moment, yeah. And I'm, well, at the moment, I'm, I'm, um, I'm just using Python to create scripts to automatize processes on, on the server. But, um, and I'm, I'm using R to, to plot PCAs, basically. But yeah, I, I I want to explore, you know, other ways to to plot other than ggplot, you know. So that's that's why I'm here, basically. <laughs> okay, great, Thanks. thank you. Yeah, Alex. Well, we can't hear you, Alex. Give you one couple of seconds to try, and then we'll move on to Amy. We'll see, see if it works. No, I think not. Okay, Amy, would you like to try? Hello, hi everyone. My name is Amy, and I'm based in University College Cork in Ireland, and I'm interested in the data analysis and visualization in Python because. Um, I am a postgraduate student as well, and so I'm interested in using this. Oh, um, I'm interested in um, an introduction to this course uh, for my work in my PhD. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> uh, my name is Andrew Merza. I'm based at the University of Reading, um, and uh, sort of work part time also for, for NCAS. I'm a research scientist working on uh, high resolution ocean modeling. And my motivation for this course is basically to refresh it. Uh, it's been seven years, eight years since I've had to use Python. And of course, uh, a lot has changed in that time. Thank you. Yep, thanks. I won't interject. I'll just have uh, once one person finishes and the next person feel free to feel free to go. Good morning, everyone. I'm working in Durham University, basically with pathogen genomics, uh, drug discovery. So basically what I'm doing is using uh, bioinformatics to find SNPs and other genomic structural changes, copy number variations, for instance. Uh, I'm basically improving how to plot results in a more friendly, catchy manner. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Hilal. Uh, I'm based on Brunel University London. So I'm a PhD researcher uh, in electrical engineering. So I have been using Python for optimization algorithms. So I'm here to improve it in terms of data analysis and visualization. So thank you. 
Hello everyone, good morning. Uh, I'm Tushantan from Northumbria University, UK. So I'm doing my PhD in, uh, it's related to civil engineering and also material engineering. So for my research PhD, so I need to deal with data and also plot uh, to aggregate. So how the behavior changes when the formulas and changes and everything. So I'm here for that one. Hi, um, my name's Catherine. I'm a research fellow at Northumbria University in the geography department. Um, and I'm wanting to use Python um, in a number of ways, partly for data analysis, but also for visualization purposes. So hopefully this course will be really useful for me. Hi, my name is Colin. I'm also from Durham and I'm more interested in the data visualization part, how to make the graphs look better. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kelvin. I'm a PhD student at um, University College London. So I'm based in the Department of Chemical Engineering and I will have to use Python to do Monte Carlo simulations of nanoparticle interactions. So um, that generates a lot of data and of course knowing how to visualize it will be important. Yep. Thank you. Hello everyone, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, I'm a PhD student at Northumbria University. Uh, working on aerodynamic analysis. So I work with large data sets, most likely, and obviously learning how to automate that sort of stuff will definitely come in handy. So that's why I'm here as well. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. Yeah, you uh, saw, your, saw your introduction in the chat, so. <laughs> Um, so, uh, hi everyone, I'm Nihal Hassan. I'm based at Newcastle University. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in uh, digital health technologies. So, I use Python quite a lot in everything, basically. Uh, I'm attending the session today for more practice. You know, it's a language at the end of the day, uh, and I hope to get that. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter, I'm research manager at Northumbria University. I've dabbled in Python a little bit just to, to run APIs and get data from APIs, but I'd, I'd really like to, to learn to use it for the whole pipeline um, of data prep, cleaning, and particularly visualization. Hi, uh, my name is Rav. I'm a PhD student at Northumbria uh, with Marshall. Um, my research is based on um, aerodynamics and aero acoustics of uh, commercial vehicles. And I've used traditional software like TechPlot, etc., cetera, to visualize my data. But I'm looking forward to learning how to use Python. Thank you. Hi, I'm Thomas from uh, the University of Edinburgh. And I'm working on molecular modeling of nanoporous materials and I mostly use Python for uh, automatize my uh, uh, my simulations, and uh, but my knowledge is a bit patchy. So yeah. Hey, hello. Uh, my, my name is Yurifine from Brno University, and uh, I my my research mainly focuses on climate change uh, flood risk analysis. And uh, I only use a little for Python, but currently my research mainly rely on R. So that's why I want to attend this session to learn some skills on Python. Thank you. Good morning, uh, I'm Jin Chang from the Samurai University. Uh, my research area is in thermodynamic and uh, renewable energy sectors. I'm interested in applying uh, Python and some other vi uh, visualization methods in my experimental data processing. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks everyone. We may, for the, some people may be uh, 
got kicked out because of I don't know some connecting issues and then rejoined again. So there's a possibility that there's maybe one or two people who we've not had a chance uh, to hear from. But it's great. It's nice to get an impression of what what people are trying to do and and also your backgrounds and different areas of research. So um, as you will have seen uh, in the description of the of the session, we are. Uh, so, it, so yeah, we're covering, we're covering uh, it's introduction to, it starts with introduction to Python, really, introduction to programming in Python. So I'm assuming that everybody who's signed up for the course has, you know, had a look at the um, uh, the course materials and decided that, yeah, this is worth, worth it for them. So we'll go through what some of the um, important things to take into account are, and then working on, on uh, how to, how to ingest and, and sort of filter data, manipulate data efficiently. Uh, using pandas and then various ways of plotting and, and, and then automating your workflow. So um, I will share my screen. Um, so. Okay. So, so I think, okay, everybody should be able to see this. This at the moment, the terminal screen on the right hand side might be quite small. So what I've done is I've, I've set up a, um, so you, yeah, I've set up um, um, a uh, arrangement, which I suspect uh, will be useful. So I will keep at, uh, at all times pretty much, I will keep on the left hand side, the course materials, the browser with the course materials open. And on the right hand side, I will um, have my terminal window, um, which is where you will see um, when I am uh, demonstrating coding. So for anybody, so yeah, as the plot, uh, as the poll showed, a fair few people are new to the Carpentries approach of, of courses. So uh, the Carpentries, which is software carpentry, data carpentry, HPC carpentry, and might be other Carpentries as well. The approach to these courses is very hands-on. So basically, um, uh, we'll go through the materials um, uh, and it'll be somewhat uh, me talking and demonstrating and doing things and, and, and trying things in front of you as, and messing up as I go along. Uh, but the idea is that I suppose that's why it's called carpentry, because you learn by seeing uh, somebody doing it, even if <laughs> so ideally maybe from a master, but actually it's also useful to learn from people who are who are not a master and who get everything absolutely right. Because part of what, what we're trying to teach you is not not necessarily, not just or not even necessarily mainly um, some uh, particular commands that you need to always remember, some particular options about how to uh, filter and data and the particular things that you need to remember. It's really about um, teaching you sort of how to fish. That is the, as, as a metaphor for teaching you how to help yourself. So hopefully you should come away from this course both with um, some ideas about how to use Python efficiently, how to uh, get data, filter data, and plot data, but also how to keep on improving after the course. So the focus is almost just as much uh, on that as it is um, on actually learning some very specific commands, say. So, um, so that's how we will uh, go about things. Um, so as I said, feel free to ask a question in the chat at any point or raise your hand to speak. So uh, you can see the outline of uh, the schedule on the left hand side here. So uh, we will start actually by describing um, a, in a little bit of, uh, we'll say a little bit about, let me make sure I've got the instructor view here. So I'm sorry, the, the learner view here. So what you are seeing on the browser mimics what, uh, what you yourself see. Okay, so um, the number of files here, we will not need any of the files right yet so far. So I'm assuming everybody has uh, Python installed. So there are various ways you can use Python. So Python's a, Python's a language, right? So um, it's a programming language, a scripting language. Um, now the question is where, how do, you, how do you run it? So there's various options as you'll see described um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the setup. So they talk about Jupyter Notebook, there's talk about a uh, Spider uh, IDE, Integrated Development Environment. You may or may not have had a chance to look at these, but the most basic way to use Python is simply if you're in a, in a terminal uh, window, 
um, at least if you're using Linux or Mac OS. Uh, if you're on Windows, you should you should um, use the uh, uh, on the start bar launch uh, Anaconda prompt, and then you can start Python. So if I'm in a in a basic uh, sort of terminal session, so I'm, I can start the the Python interpreter from the command line. And I'm going to use this approach rather than a Jupyter Notebook. So a Jupyter Notebook, which you may, may be familiar with, and the instructions in the, in the, on the website say how to start it, um, basically gives you a nice web uh, browser-based interface to run Python commands, um, which can be very nice as a way of working through analyzing data. However, the approach I'm, I'm going to take uh, for the course today and tomorrow is to do everything um, in, on the command line and in a terminal window. Um, the reason for that is there's a couple of reasons. It's kind of the most basic and the most, um, and, and since also this is a course that we're giving as part of Archer 2, uh, with the idea being that it's focused on, in, in some many cases, on using Python in the context of being logged on to a remote machine. Uh, and maybe editing code there and running code there. Um, although you can, in principle, in many cases, make make it work where you edit a Jupyter notebook in your web browser and it executes remotely on another machine, um, is it, it may, it's often easier just to go to uh, command line and terminal window. So we we'll get started. Nobody said there. And the ecologists, so you see the title of these course materials is Data Analysis and Visualization in Python for Ecologists, but uh, it's generically useful. Some of the examples will indeed be ecology examples. So if you've not already done so, this would be a good point at which to start your Python session. So you've got two options. There's Python and there's IPython. They are very similar. We'll just start with Python. So if I start, if I execute the Python command, um, let me do a little poll uh, just to make sure that everybody is got Python. Um, have you got the Python interpreter running? Okay, yeah. Pretty much every has. Okay, great. So let's get let's get started. So um, so we're not going to launch a Jupyter notebook. As I said, we're using the Python interpreter. Before we start, it says here something about the motivation for using Python. So as you probably already know, as because you're interested in this course, Python is a very useful, flexible language. It's used a lot. It was originally actually invented by Guido van Rossum as a way to um, as a way to actually do lots of small sort of system administration tasks, namely as a way to uh, uh, you know deal with deal with files, deal with deal with settings in an operating system, uh, manage manage settings. So um, it wasn't designed it, it wasn't designed as a sort of monolithic uh, programming language to to do say work for, for example scientific computing, although it's been used now in recent years decades a lot for scientific computing. It was originally designed as a very simple to use, uh, flexible um, scripting language. So, um, yeah, as it mentions here, there's some advantages. It's it's, okay, it's, it's it, there's a big community of uh, a big ecosystem of packages that will that can allow you to do things. Um, it says it's reprodu reproducible, and that what that is specifically talking, referring to in the context of do using it for data analysis and visualization is that once you have obviously workflow that is described in a uh, standalone files or multiple files that's a script, then you can share that workflow and um, uh, that means that they can be reproduced. Um, so Python, this language is, is very flexible. Uh, that has actually some impacts on how fast it is. So, so if you look at, for example, uh, on, on a machine like, like Archer 2, where people are running these large scientific simulations, those are not written in Python um, usually. Uh, they're almost all in, a, in, a, in, in traditional um, uh, compiled languages like C or C++. Um, so, uh, okay, knowing your way around Anaconda, fine. People have got it. I've got uh, Python running. We won't need to use data yet, but in principle, you can organize. These are a little bit about about coding. 
find about how to use the spider IDE that can all be useful later uh, after indeed after the workshop so I, I certainly encourage you to have a look at this uh, after the workshop if you haven't already there are links to help so even today you might find it useful to look at pandas documentation this is teaching you again how to fish how to find help in the future uh, you're not sit physically sitting next to people presumably uh, maybe in some cases you are um, but there's ways also to, to ask for help so that's the basic idea about uh, before we start Let's continue then. So the first, um, uh, these are called episodes, <laughs> apparently. So that's a carpentry uh, or lesson, carpentry jargon for for these kind of um, self-contained modules. So with this episode, we're going to see based on basic uh, uh, descriptions about how to program in Python and how to represent data now in, in Python. Uh, what elementary objects do we have? So we've, we've just started the Python interpreter. So we can use so we use Python two ways, right? We can use Python interpreter like like we've just done, launched it, and then we use it interactively. Um, or what we what we can do is uh, we can put together a script which uh, sets in stone uh, a workflow and and, and execute uh, and execute that um, all at once as we like. Um, so. Um, yeah, so the, so Python is very flexible. So you don't need to, you don't need to start by defining anything uh, as as you sometimes do in some programming languages. Yes, thanks, Nathan. Yeah, if you have any problem. So in some programming languages, you will need to start by saying, okay, if I want to add two numbers, you first need to say, okay, you need to tell you need to program saying, okay, here's one number. It's it's a integer or it's a, some other kind of number, and here's another number. It's also an integer. Then give them values and then add them. But Python is very flexible. It will infer what things are um, and it has some rules for inferring what they are so for example if you just do two plus two the answer is four okay you say that's obvious so if you do 2.0 plus 2.0 the answer is 4.0 so you can already understand that it's inferring something about what these uh, numbers are and it's it's using some kind of way of representing these numbers and is useful you you you, you don't always have to know or care but it is important it can it can be important to understand what python is inferring and what it thinks or what it is using to represent um the underlying uh, variables or objects that you're dealing with um and indeed one of the one of the very first commands that we get to uh, just a little bit later no doubt is the type command so the type command is quite a useful command it's a um built-in function which means you can at any point uh, without defining it use it and give it an argument so if you fill in uh, what is the type of two <laughs> then that tells you what python has inferred uh, or has decided to use to represent this thing two if you ask it what is 2.0 um, it is another kind of thing an object of a different class or category um, so one of the things that's often said about python is that the way to think about it is everything is an object um, and this is type asking what type something is it basically asking what kind of type of object it is or in other words what python is using to represent it so when you gave it when you told python 2 python inferred that that was that you meant that that's an integer and it's going to represent it as an integer and treat it as an integer um, when you uh, set 2.0 is going to represent it as a float so this is something useful to be aware of and later on um, we'll see that it's it's useful to to know what the type of something is if you're trying to figure out what you can or can't do with it or if you've written some code and it's not behaving like how you think it should behave it could be because you're making an assumption about what the type of something is so we'll come back to that um, so the sim there's a okay there's a the typical example is print hello world so um, uh, so the print output um, explicitly you can do that if you um, uh, if you had put the for example the the, the uh, two plus two in a in a, in a uh, script and it run that script separately from Python, it wouldn't have uh, shown the result for 
out to your to your terminal screen uh, it would have only it would have just run and not shown it so to, in some cases you need to actually print something explicitly to get the get the output okay so uh, we've already kind of gone into assigning variables um, oh, sorry, we've not, <laughs> not gone into assigning variables we've talked about what Python how Python represents uh, a data but we've not actually we've used these numbers but we've not actually assigned them to any variable so we can assign uh, numbers, we can assign uh, strings, whatever we care to uh, give as input. We can assign that to variables uh, in order to manipulate these variables. And that, uh, for example, we can say a equals 2.0 and then type the type of a is, as we saw, um, the, the same type that we are, that, we, that Python inferred to represent um, 2.0 itself. And um, yeah, the example here just just highlights that in the case again of something that Python will infer to be an integer based on its value that's being assigned, and something that Python will infer to be a a float or floating point um, uh, numerical value. Um, there's something that I can sort of show you now, which is already an inter interesting interesting. Um, Thing. Oh, let's see. Okay, so this will be my first first example of, sort of showing what happens if, if you prepare. So, well, if you if you don't check, uh, say we say we give this value uh, one four uh, one five nine. Okay, so clearly the type of pi value is then a float. Um, however, uh, we can also uh, see if we are if we can access any um, uh, any uh, at any other attributes of this uh, object called pi value. So I've added a dot there. So I've added a dot at the end. And why have I done that? And why has all this just appeared? I've added a dot because um, a dot after a variable is a way to access uh, methods, if any methods exist, that are defined uh, to operate on the basis of that uh, that object on the basis of whatever value that variable has. So um, in other words, there are some, uh, for, for the kind of object that pi value is, which is a class float, there are a number of uh, built-in methods which can, uh, which Python will, can, is able to execute based on uh, that, in that uh, based on that float value. So I've how these number, how these options suddenly appeared. Well, what I did was I typed dot, and then I typed tab twice. Um, and if you do that, then typically what you will see is you will see the the possible options, the possible methods appear. Um, now you see, uh, I just wanted to highlight one, uh, or actually two options here. So there are, as you can see, these are. Uh, so I said methods. There are two things that we see here in this list we see uh, things that after the dot are called some name and then uh, brackets, and we have some things that are without brackets. The things with brackets are methods, um, but and the, and the things without brackets are simply uh, attributes uh, of, the, of the object. So although, so, we, so pi value is a float, but it seems to be, when we look into it, that there are uh, these two attributes uh, of pi value, which is the real attribute and the imaginary, the image attribute. Image doesn't stand for, um, well, the picture, but in this case, Im uh, the imaginary value. So in principle, um, this, this same, what this tells us that, aha, actually, this float object could be used to represent a complex number, right? So if we, if we ask, if we now ask, what is that value? What is that attribute? What is the value? of that attribute uh, pi value dot real, press enter. That was the number we just entered. What is the attribute of pi value dot imaginary? It is zero, so it has no imaginary part. So you can see how, even though you gave only the, the real value, you it, it, based on what Python has inferred that to be and how it's chosen to store it, it is simultaneously init initialized uh, another attribute, which is the imaginary value. So why am I showing you this? Again, like this might not matter to you, this particular uh, real imaginary value, this particular thing about a float, but 
this is about starting to become more familiar with um, what uh, is going on under the hood so that uh, you know what what's possible what's what's uh, going on and, and what what to expect and, and what you can do and, and to understand also what's going wrong because it might be that you pass this pi value into a function and that function makes some assumption about what I don't know the imaginary part is but you hadn't thought about what the imaginary part is because you just gave a, a real part so that's something to be aware of um, Okay, so uh, it also gives example of uh, in the, in on the left here in the in the course materials. So, okay, if you uh, assign a uh, some text to a variable, which we put in quotation marks, um, some text. So what is the type of text? It is a string class variable. Um, in Python, we are free to use both double quotation marks and single quotation marks. Um, you just need to be consistent. So it's useful to have both options because sometimes you are uh, enclosing a string within another string. <laughs> so in that case, you you might want to have two ways of denoting uh, a string. Otherwise, um, starting the intern starting the the internal string with the same quotation marks would terminate. Wouldn't work. It would terminate. It would end the string, and you you know you'd be left um, hanging, so to speak. Okay, so this is just explaining now what, what I just said. So everything in Python has a type. We just looked at the type of this text, or really the type of uh, number, integer, and also this float. Yes, good question. So how to, how to change the type? Um, so there are ways to do that. Yeah, we'll get to that actually later today. So there's a whole, there's a whole session or episode which actually uh, looks at how to change uh, the type of a variable. Um, so yeah, we'll look at that later, definitely. So hopefully hopefully it'll be answered. I think it makes sense to just wait until then because it's all, all laid out quite, quite, quite clearly then. Um, certainly get to that. Um, so, um, yeah, so, the, so the, the, this here now is making the point that, okay, you could print a number uh, as I already said, um, so if you ha so if you had some of the stuff that we just entered interactively uh, in a Python session, if we had that as part of a Python script, so you can try that yourself. I'm going to exit Python interpreter. Oh, okay, exit in brackets. I always use Control D, but you couldn't see if I press Control D, right? If I press Control D, that exits the Python interpreter. So if I open the text editor, so now I'm now back in my terminal. But if I open a text editor for example, Emacs, and I create a script called uh, example.py, and I paste in that example. Uh, now I can run this script from the command line with the command Python and example.py. So that prints out data carpentry um, only once, whereas in the example text, sorry, in the example, um, just simply uh, printing, uh, saying text or giving the command text where it's interactively that prints out to screen the value of the variable that's not the case when you're running the script so that's why you need this explicit print command uh, okay so um so here talks about how print and type are built in functions in python so those are available to use always um, doesn't mean they'll always give a sensible answer, but they will be recognized as functions that you can try to use. And it says later on we'll introduce methods and user-defined functions. I've already mentioned methods where I did pi value dot um, something. So um, operators, yeah, we can use. Uh, it should be no surprise to you that we can do basic arithmetic operations with uh, with uh, numbers in Python. So we can multiply, we can add, we can raise something to the power, <clears throat> and uh, the results uh, will be if they are um, right. So if we have. I'll go back into a Python session. Uh, oh yeah, so clear it's not defined. So. Uh, for the sake of keeping purely at the moment, for keeping my my screen nice and clear, what I'm going to do is exit this Python session. Then I'm going to start. Actually, instead of Python, I'm now going to switch to IPython. What's the difference between Python and IPython? Um, in case you don't know, um, so both I, 
both, both Python and IPython are Python interpreters. That is, that means that uh, we can use them uh, either as inter either interactively or as commands to run. Um, sorry, no, I, you and I use IPython to run a Python script. Oh, actually, you kind of. Uh, oh, let's... Never do, but it's <laughs> a good question. See, this is okay. This is see then how you discover what you know and what you don't know. So I never tried it because in my mind, IPython is something you use only interactively, but you can just use IPython as an interpreter command to run a Python script. So there you go. Um, what's the difference? Uh, well, if you start Python, this so you see that my particular installation of Python, the, as it's printed out here, the version is Python version, Python interpreter version 3.11.5. It tells you when <clears throat> something about when it was compiled, when it was built, and something about the compiler that was used to, to build it. Now, if I close that and I launch IPython, you'll see that it's actually the, in this case, the same, same version, um, uh, same version of Python as it claims. So it's no surprise because these were installed as part of the same Anaconda install. And actually, IPython is is basically a wrapper around Python uh, is how you can kind of think about it. So it's basically the Python interpreter, the standard Python interpreter with some additional functionality for convenience. So one of those things is, okay, so also the display is slightly different to begin with. It, it talks about, it explicitly prints out these input and output lines, which are numbered. If you have ever run a Jupyter notebook or if you're even if you're running one now, who knows, you may have decided to do that instead of using a terminal session. Then you'll recognize this in out business um, because this looks like what you have in a Jupyter notebook in the web browser. It explicitly prints out the in and out um, prefixes on your input and output lines for clarity uh, and also for reference. Okay, so why did I say I wanted to use IPython? Well, because I'm I like to make use occasionally of little additional things that you can do in IPython that are not actually Python uh, script commands. For example, I like to clear my screen sometimes just to make it less messy and to make it easier for you to visually see, which I do by typing clear. Now, clear is not a um, Python command. It's not in the Python standard. It's not a Python language command. It's just some additional thing you can do in IPython. Um, there's some other things you can do as well, which is which you know is not Python. So, uh, for example, because I'm on a on a machine that uses um, it's on a Mac, which recognizes I'm using Bash and terminal, so I can use a PWD command like in Linux if I was in the terminal. However, in IPython, I can also use the PWD, PWD print working directory command um, to print a current working directory. Now, PWD is a shell command; it's not a Python command. So this is kind of weird. I'm not executing Python by uh, a Python command by running PDPD, but it's it's useful because it, I can also run ls to see what's in the directory where where I started my um, my Python session. I can even do cd to a different directory if I like. So kind of simultaneously moving around in my file system using uh, terminal commands. Yeah. So for example, um, well if I I can go <laughs> just if I was if I was using bash. So this might differ slightly for your um, if you're using Windows, it might be slightly different. Uh, I don't know which commands, if all commands, uh, IPython has, uh, has implemented to deal with PowerShell or the Windows command prompt. But in Linux or, or Mac OS, uh, yeah, you can just do it like that, for example. So then this is quite nice because if you're using IPython interactively um, to you know move around your, your files, uh, your folders, get to data, find the right data, check, remind yourself, where am I again? Um, this is just really convenient. Um, so that's why I often use IPython um, and uh, why I'll use it from now on for the, for the, for the course. So uh, what was I gonna show? Yes, I was, gonna, I was gonna clear my screen. That's why I went to IPython. And then I was gonna show you out of all these arithmetic operations, what it didn't show was division. So it's it's clear that if I do six times seven, it adds to 42. Um, I wonder whether it shows that number. Okay, and if I ask for what's the type of that, it's an integer. However, if I do six divided by seven, uh, clearly, okay, so it's inferred that, that that is a float. So no surprises there. So I was just showing you kind of consistency about what, what Python simply goes ahead and does. 
You can also, so as well as these arithmetic, arithmetic operators, there's uh, basic um, comparison logical operators. So you can ask Python to assess the truthfulness of a condition of a statement like is, is three greater than four? Oh, oops. That is false, that evaluates to false. You can ask is um, three equal to three? That evaluates to true. If you put assign three to a variable and ask is a equal to three, that is so true. Um, you can use uh, logical combiner, combinators like uh, like the AND or um, I'm not sure whether others like XOR uh, are, also, are also available. Um, no, okay, so. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so that, okay, so, so those are some of the, the basic, um, basic uh, commands. Now we come to some of the basic elements in, in Python, the basic uh, type of um, uh, useful elements to um, or data types to to work with to work with data. Um, so uh, lists are a very common uh, data structure. So um, more abstract than simply a an integer or a float or a string. Uh, there are ways of structure. There are way of storing more than one thing. So uh, if we have, um, we can define it in square brackets. So if we assign uh, a, some kind of collection of things enclosed in a square bracket to a variable, then what is the type of that, uh, of that variable? That is a list. So a list is a basic type in Python. Um, now a list <clears throat> doesn't need to be consistent in terms of the um, elements, what the elements are. So I can have, I can also create a list like this, which has two elements, which I, I, know, I know Python will have inferred to be integers. And I can have one element that's actually a string. Now, how do we access elements of a list? We index, we access them by indexing with, also with square brackets and, uh, lists in Python start at start with index equal to zero. So first element is element index zero, which is one second. Oh, <laughs> this, the third element is the one with index two, which is AD. The second element is the element with index one, which in this case is equal to two. That's great. Great. What about if I don't want to type that out individually? Well, can we iterate over all the loop, all the, all the elements? Yes, we can. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Yeah, Nathan pointed out in the chat. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So there's, so um, the uh, the OS dot change there. That is a genuine Python command. So what what Nathan's given there is an example in the chat. Is that if you didn't have IPython, but uh, you had you had Python, and if you wanted to make sure, for example, that your workflow included a command to change directory and you want you put that in a script in a python script and you want that python script to be to work properly regardless of some somebody whether somebody runs it with ipython or as is more likely if they run it with python then you better ensure that all the commands in that script are valid python commands and you should not rely on the kind of interactive commands that uh, these are called magic commands in ipython um, so um, yeah, you should rely on these magic commands. So in that case, the alternative command that you could use is a command called chdir or change dir. That's a genuine Python uh, uh, method. Um, and that, that method is available through uh, a package called the OS for operating system package. So um, to use that within our Python script or interactively, we first have to import the package. So that's gen generally the case with Python. Um, anything you want to use that's in a package, you need to first import the package and then you um, call it uh, as follows. And that will change directory to the, the string specified. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. So just going back to this, uh, this list that we were looking at, I will clear my screen. Then 
uh, you can iterate over the elements in this list. So how does that work? So what we do is uh, when it comes to, um, to iterating, we want to basically say, okay, for all the elements um, in, uh, so we, so in lots of language you would write, uh, you would say for some index variable in a range from the, uh, say one or zero, starting at one or zero to the uh, size of the thing you're iterating over. But in, in Python, there's a nice syntax, which just says for something, some new variable name in uh, something which you can iterate over. So there's actually a, a concept in Python of an iterable. <laughs> an iterable is some data structure, um, for example, a list, which Python can iterate over. So whenever you have an iterable, something that can be iterated over, that means that you can uh, use this syntax saying for uh, num in or so for something for some variable for some new variable name, you can think of that as element. For element in your iterable, then you can say do something, and then the thing to do would have to be something enclosed in a block of code that is a one level down. And how do we uh, form blocks of code in Python? This works via um, indentation. Uh, we need to specify the colon at the end of this line, and then if we press enter, it automatically brings it onto the next line, which is indented. So that means that uh, we're going to specify there whatever we want to happen for each iteration of this for loop, which we're creating, which is going to iterate over the elements of the data structure uh, uh, that amounts, that is the variable numbers. So um, the thing is, we don't, we don't, what we don't need to do now, as you might do in some languages, is, is say, okay, numbers and then some index variable like i or something, which we haven't defined, or even num. No, it's it's simpler than that. If we want to print out the value, the elements of that number, we simply do print num because for each iteration, num automatically takes on the the next say value within that iterable press enter one more time in order to actually finish the definition of my code block and simultaneously execute that for loop so that prints out all the um all the numbers all the elements of uh, well they're not numbers not all of them are numbers but prints out all the elements like we equally have said Print out type. So I've messed up my annotation slightly there, but I think it's still okay. Ah, haha. Uh -huh. I said print out type. I just said type. It doesn't show because this is one of these things that doesn't automatically print out. So there we go. I needed to explicitly say print. Then it will return, uh, tell me that Python inferred those elements of numbers being integer, integer, and a string for the final one. Okay. So I hope I, you may be trying, trying this around and playing around with, with things. Uh, some of this might be uh, um, just rehash and, and, and uh, not new to, to you, but hopefully the way that I'm presenting it and the way I'm presenting, thinking about interrogating what is what uh, will be useful even, even later on, even if all of this is, 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 is potentially not new to you. Um, so it says here, as it says, indentation is very important. So it says how you got these dots that, uh, well, the dots don't show here, but you can see them in my terminal screen that created automatically. So in, in, so in Python, uh, it looks very clean. So in some languages you would sort of indent, you could identify code block by having, you know, curly braces like this and then insert something in, in there, some stuff. But that's not the case in Python. It all works on, the, it all works on indentation. Um, what just happened, by the way, what you saw was when I pressed the up arrow key. So so just like with terminal commands within, um, certainly within IPython, I think within Python, standard Python interpreter as well, you can go through the history of commands you've issued with up or down. So that can be very useful. And you can even start typing something you've already, that's similar to what you've already typed before. So if I start to type for num, you can already see it's grayed out uh, and trying to remember, it's remembered what I've started typing before. And if I press, uh, no, not, not enter. <laughs> if I start again and type for num, it remembers, so I type, to the right arrow key to the right, it will auto complete that. Um, so that can be very useful. Um, okay. So um, 
Oh yeah, so here there's some there's some example of what you can do with 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 a list. Uh, you can um, add elements to a list by by appending. So I can set there's a couple of things I can do. If I have a list that exists like numbers, uh, I think we already set a, we already set a value uh, one of the elements to something else previously, like to a string. Um, I can now set set this. So clearly I can I can not only uh, print out the elements but also change their their values like this. Um, then uh, if I want to um, add an element to that list, I could either um, uh, uh, take take all, uh, yeah, either reformulate it from scratch and write out all the elements together, or I can just, uh, with, with a new one, or I can say numbers, dot append um, something um, like a string again. And what is numbers then? Yeah, so I can add it, add an element. So, so you can add elements like that manually. So this, I mean, uh, when you're dealing with data, uh, I assume, you know, as we'll see later, when you're reading data from a file, this, this is not something you do manually, um, but this, this is useful to know. Because um, typically you'll use lists to, um, to maybe define some things that you want to iterate over in your code, maybe some different options. Uh, and lists are generically uh, used in Python, so it's, it's useful to be able to to know how to access them and how to iterate over them. Um, it's not good practice, by the way, as an aside. It's not good practice to to store uh, large uh, numbers of things, uh, large numbers of numbers, for example, as data in a list, and then to iterate explicitly over the elements of that list with a for loop. Python is very slow if you do that. It's much better to use things like pandas, as we will see later, and the data frame, a data structure, which is part of pandas, or even more sort of generically and importantly, when you're using Python programming, a an array, specifically a NumPy array. That's a NumPy, it's a package that you would import. It's what a lot of almost all numerical computing with Python is built on top of. Um, it's important to use those kinds of data structures rather than lists to store and manipulate uh, and, and do things with data because uh, for various reasons, um, it's m much, much faster uh, in part because these, these data structures like NumPy arrays, what they, for example, define uh, what the data type is consistently for all the elements. So you can see that we, we've seen that a list can be a list of anything. They can be all kinds of different things. What that means is that Python can at no point uh, when it is executing uh, code that looks, that deals with a list, at no point is it going to make any assumption ahead of time about what those elements, what kind of things those elements are. It goes across all of them, and for each element it encounters, it checks what kind of element are you, what can I therefore do, right? So all this is actually extra processing, if you like, in terms of how the Python interpreter works, which adds an overhead, which means that explicitly iterating over large amounts of data stored in the list is slow. That is why um, we should only use lists for, for say, options or for manipulating sort of uh, Code, yeah, things in your code rather than actually as a fundamental data structure to store, uh, manipulate large amounts of, of data. Just as, a, as, as an aside, um, but it's an important aside because it's, it means that it can mean the difference between, you know, it can mean 10, 100,000, 10,000, 100,000 times faster code in some cases. So it's something to be aware of. Okay, uh, so we'll get, well, we're, I've, I, I realize I've been talking a lot and although you've been trying a maybe one or two things here. Uh, your eyes might be glazing over a bit or ears might be glazing over a bit, but no fear, soon we'll get to one of these, um, we'll get to one of these challenges. These yellow boxes as we come along, there are opportunities for you to try out something yourself, for me to just not talk for a minute <laughs> or two. And uh, we'll, these, these challenge boxes, yellow boxes are natural start, stopping points at which we'll pause for a bit and I'll check with a, with a poll how people are getting along. Then we'll maybe have a little quick chat discussion about what sort of the learning point is about these challenges. Um, but before to, before that, two more things to just uh, help. So this is 
how teaching you how to fish, right? Appear on my screen. So there's a uh, two ways at least of of finding um, help about how to do something, um, what you can or cannot do. So um, the example it gives there is if you use the built-in function help and give it as an argument the data the, the the variable that we've created numbers which we know is a list it tells you some things so it tells you it's recognized okay the thing you've asked me for help on is a is a list object and then it gives you for um, the list object it gives you uh something you I mean, you can scroll here with the mouse or you can yeah spacebar works as well there's a list of uh um as a definition, first of all, it says, uh, what is a list? It's a built-in mutable sequence. Um, sequence means ordered, uh, i.e. you can index, you can access it via numerically by indexing with, with a number, as we've been doing. Mutable means it can change, and that will become relevant in a minute when we look at tuples, uh, the elements of which cannot um, cannot be changed. And then we see a listing of, of um, attributes and functions that that uh, are available for us to use uh, with the list object. So getting to this help uh, uh, print um, output is, is one way of, of seeing a listing of what you can do with the list object. If I exit that by pressing Q um, for quit, I can type, let's see what other method works. Often you can add a question mark at the end of a variable name or at the end of a, a class name, an object type, or at the end of a uh, uh, method name. Let's see if that works. Yeah, that also provides me with um, some, you know, you recognize some of the documentation here. This is actually the, the header, the first bit of that more elaborate help. Just prints that out. So if I type numbers dot uh, and do tab once, it, it shows me, um, as we saw before, a listing of possible uh, methods and attributes. It looks a bit different now than before when I did dot and tab, because before I was doing it in the standard Python interpreter. Uh, and it looks a bit nicer in the, in the IPython interpreter. So it shows you what, uh, again, it shows you just the names of those individual methods. And if I type, if I want to know what those do, I can either look at the, the help we just looked at, or I can do a name of the method, a question mark. So it tells me uh, a little bit more. Let's see if I do with the brackets around. No, that doesn't make any difference. No, you shouldn't do that. You should just do question mark at the end. It tells you what the method does. Okay, so that's one way to find help. There are also docu there's also documentation online. So what I just what we looked at when we did help uh, numbers. So let's see what happens if we do help numbers or append. It's the same. So when we used that, we saw that there was a big um, for numbers or indeed for list. If I simply say list, it gives me actually the same um, the same uh, same information. Uh, a lot of this this will be online as well. So in in the browser, so you can also look in a web browser and just look for Python documentation. Um, but um, it's useful to have here right at your fingertips. You notice, by the way, that uh, list here was highlighted in green, which uh, the IPython interpreter does. That is to highlight that it's a reserved keyword. So it's a, uh, a keyword that uh, you shouldn't, um, it, it, it describes the, the fundamental um, list data, data structure, data type. And uh, you can therefore check to see if something you know, as we were doing before, if you type numbers is a list, you can use it that way um, to check whether that is, whether the type is equal to that, that, that reserved keyword. You can also assign <laughs> this something, I think, but I don't, don't do this because you, you, um, you're just messing up this reserved keyword. So um, yeah, that can get you into trouble. So I said two things before we get to the challenge. <laughs> Promise we're almost there for me to not to stop, stop talking. Second thing is uh, a tuple. So just to introduce one other data structure uh, other than a list, um, namely a tuple. So what is the syntax for defining a tuple? It is uh, as follows. Rather than square brackets, we use um, just parentheses, uh, for example, like that. Um, so what is 
So tuple, tuple is a is a reserved keyword. I can ask help. What is a tuple? It is a built-in sequence, just like a list. However, it is immutable. So what does that mean? It means that although I can access a tuple with an index, I can access different elements. Unlike a list, I cannot now set the value of any of those elements to anything, be it a number or a string or anything. It simply complains and throws an error saying the kind of thing you're trying to set one of its elements of, namely a tuple, doesn't support item, item assignment. So tuples are immutable. You cannot change the elements. You can only um, define a whole new whole new tuple. So you can certainly change the tuple as a whole. You can redefine the same variable name as a different tuple. That's fine. It's not going to complain to you about that. But again, none of those individual elements you could change. So when do you use a tuple? Well, you use a tuple for <laughs> if you don't want to change. <laughs> if they're just typically, I mean, I think in programming, if I think about when to use this, it's typically if you have a couple of different options, a few different options, which are kind of canonical. And they're like, uh, oh, I don't know. I'm going to get into trouble here if I talk about biology. But um, if you, I don't know, if you have some fixed set of amino acids, right? You know, you're not going to change. There's only, you only care about the essential amino acids. Or no, you only, only care about a fixed number of amino acids. And you say, okay, this is my kind of fixed basis sets of, uh, of amino acids or it's my fixed uh, set of, I don't know, wave numbers or something, something that, that doesn't change. Um, so then, yeah, you, you could set, set it like that to make sure it doesn't change to reflect, reflect the usage. Um, okay, so um, I'll give you a minute now to, to work on this challenge box um, and then, uh, yeah, I'll do a Okay, I think I think most people have uh, most people have have passed with this. So let's um, just start to discuss a bit the, the conclusions. Um, so basically, as we saw, uh, so when you execute this a list one equals five, um, you're able to change that uh, element of a list. Um, namely the second element because the list starts at zero. And when you try to do the same for uh, an element of the of a tuple, then as we just saw, you get an error um, as we discussed. Then uh, the question was, what is what is the type of the tuple? Well, it's, <laughs> it's a tuple, <laughs> so Python inf that's simply confirming um, that. Then the question is about the function, built-in function len for length. So that's useful because often you want to know um, you want to know about the length of an object. Uh, there's a there's a there's a related um, I was about to say function, but actually it's an attribute that's quite useful. So so as, so the difference distinction is function is just something you can call without uh, something you can call um, standalone. It's built-in function um, length of um, of tuple, for example. Uh, you, there's also something called a, an attribute of, of many objects, which is the shape, especially of objects that hold data and other data structures as well. So if uh, you do a tuple and dot shape, let's see. Oh, okay, a tuple is an example of something that doesn't have the attribute shape, fine. <laughs> um, let's see our numbers, dot shape. No, okay, fine, neither, okay, neither, neither are lists. Neither list nor tuple has the attribute shape. We'll get we'll get to the attribute shape later. A data frame, for example, has the attribute shape, which can be useful. Uh, so does a so does a NumPy array. So that means you can easily see how many how many rows, how many columns it has, which gives you an idea of how many elements there are uh, in the along the different dimensions, which is just a multi-dimensional generalization of the length, obviously. So uh, in many cases, when you're dealing with data, you'll have the option of using the, the len command to get the length along a particular dimension, and then you need to make sure to give it something that is um, that is the right kind of thing to expect. So for example, if you look at um, here, this, so this length command worked for both the list and the tuple to give it the length. If you look at um, the help, it says, it tells you the number of items in the container. Okay, um, 
So I think if that container is a multi-dimensional container, it becomes ambiguous what the length is, or it gives you maybe the length along with the dimension that you don't care about. Um, so, uh, so yeah, then you might want to look at the shape. Okay, so that's that's that challenge. So uh, let's continue. Uh, just to round out, finish off, we've got a couple more things to talk about, then we'll have this the episode will be finished. So uh, a dictionary, so some another one of the key data structures, key primitive data structures in Python, built-in data structures. We had a list, we had a tuple, now we're talking about a dictionary. So what is a dictionary? A dictionary is um, like some where you do a lookup. Um, essentially, it's a data structure that holds pairs of objects, namely um, uh, a number of each pair being composed of a key, the thing that you use to look up the value, a value, and the actual value that you're looking up. So um, the example given is something called okay. It says uh, translation. So let's say I'm gonna I'm gonna give a slightly different example. I'm gonna say for example um, a bike. I'm gonna say a bike is a thing which uh, is, a, I'm gonna create a, a dict. So for example, um, what is the, uh, what uh, kind of things might I want to look up about a bike? Well, uh, I could look up its, um, something called its color. So I'm gonna give a key called color, which I want to be able to, to find. And then I'm gonna say that's the particular value that that key has is, is, is black. Uh, what else? Um, you could say, um, uh, what uh, is the is the another thing wheel diameter? I don't know. Random example. Then I say colon and then give the value. What could it be uh, in some kind of units of uh, millimeter uh, centimeters? Um, no millimeters. <laughs> so then uh, uh, yeah. So I've created here. I press enter there. That's created. So what is the type bike? It's a dict. Um, now, how do how can I use this? Um, I can use it as a data structure to instead instead of instead of iterating over um, this data structure element by element uh, in sequ sequentially. Dicts are typically used when you your data is not uh, something that you want to store or address necessarily sequentially, but where um, each uh, uh, where, where you typically want to use a a, a label. Um, to access uh, either a, a string or, or num number or, or some further nested data, in fact. So you can combine compositions of dicts and lists and tuples. So as part of your, for example, as part of the bike definition, I could have said, well, actually, my bike, the color of my bike is not simply one kind of color. I could say, um, my bike has various colors. It's a multicolored bike. Namely, I could define the um, the value corresponding to the key color as another dict in and of itself, which can have a couple of different uh, key value pairs. For example, uh, if if the color of my uh, saddle uh, is um, is brown, right? And then I can have, what else do I have on my bike? I've got my uh, wheels or the handlebars. If I say the, hand, the color of my handlebars is uh, silver, let's say. Right, so um, let me see if that's right. Undoubtedly, I've made a mistake, but we'll see if it, if that, if, uh, if it accepts that. Uh, oh. uh, let's see. Okay, so. My bike is still a dict, so um, to access elements of bike, I can no longer do, for example, zero. <laughs> that is a that gives me an error because it doesn't recognize zero. So what do you mean zero? This is not this is not a thing you can iterate over in that way. Uh, so if I do help, for example, if I do help um, bike, it's um, what does it tell me in the definition? Uh, Okay, it doesn't tell me it's something that I can, that's a that's a sequence. So it's not a sequence I can iterate over. Um, so how do I access elements? Well, if I want to access the uh, wheel diameter, 
I simply give it that label as an index, and then it gives me out the value. If I ask what is the, the value corresponding to the key color, it gives me out this nested dictionary. And if I ask what is the type of uh, the thing that, what is the type of the value of color, it is that it is that dict. Um, so you can see how you can start to, to build up data structures that are nested. Um, and this is with the primitive data structures like dicts and lists, which in your own code, you may get practice doing simply because you're writing things that you logically want to do. But it, when it comes to accessing these elements, the syntax for doing this and the way to think about it uh, and experience doing this will be useful also when you get to things like uh, data frames uh, or NumPy arrays where you want to access uh, data in different ways and nest it. So uh, in these instructions here, we're basically explaining what the dict is, how to access different elements. Um, then saying using for loops is a little more complicated because unlike a for loop, uh, unlike the, the list uh, or the tuple, we couldn't iterate it over sequentially because although when we, when we defined um, our, uh, our uh, dict object, the bike, when we defined it, the different keys and values were given to it in a, in a particular order left to right, but in the way that these are stored, that is that that ordering is not really actually stored fundamentally. That's 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 not stored. So if you want to access the elements uh, of the bike, um, you have to somehow um, uh, get do a little more work to get at the, the ordering. So there's a couple of ways to do it. Um, so one way to do it is as described here, it's saying, uh, yeah, actually, I'm going to take the second way because I think I think it's slightly, I don't know, I just think it's slightly nicer, but you can do either way. So the way, look at my screen, the way to iterate over the dict is uh, to say, take your, one of the things you can, one of the attributes of a dict object is, um, sorry, not the attributes, one of the methods that will return information about the uh, like about a dict object is the, the method keys. Um, and if you ask for the keys of a dict that tells you all the different labels that can be used as keys that will give you output. So uh, if you ask what kind of a thing is uh, that, what is the type of that list of keys? It's not just a list, it's just another data structure called dict keys. But fortunately, dict keys is something you can iterate over. So now what you can do is you can write a for loop. You can say for, something which we'll call key, it's not a reserved keyword, in bike of keys, in other words, for all the elements of that uh, dict keys that gets returned, do the following, print um, key itself, uh, the key itself, and then, well, they use comma in the example, I'm gonna say, oh well, yeah, I'm gonna say plus um, colon in the output, literally wanted to print a colon and then plus um, the the result the element or the value in bank that corresponds to that key press again enter again to oh here we go yes okay that makes sense so this this is why they used comma in the example so what's happened is that um, when it went through these elements one of the things that was returned was not simply a string, like the wheel, or actually the wheel diameter, diameter was a uh, was a number, which it is happy to add, which Python is happy to add to a string. Um, that is one of the automatic conversions that it can do. We talked, there was a question earlier about how, this, how do you can change one type to another. Doing this string plus something can, in some case, in a lot of cases, automatically convert maybe a number to, to a string. But when it got to the element, corresponding to the, to the color, actually that is composed of, that, that is actually a dict. So then there's no automatic conversion of a dict to a, to a string or, to, or no, nothing defined as concatenating, i.e. adding uh, a dict to, to a string. So um, I need to do something else. I need um, say, you get, this might not even work, but uh, let's see. No, it does work. Great. Okay. So 
that doesn't force it to add um, uh, to add to a string that just says output it. So, so that's that's allowed me to iterate over the the, thing, the, the dict. So uh, just coming up to eleven o'clock now. So I defined in the schedule. I'm going to stick to the schedule because you know we all have maybe reasons to, 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 to need to take the schedule and, and, and know that you're going to get a break at a certain point. And we've been going for a while now. I've been talking for a while. So chance now again to, uh, during the break or, or after, give some time after as well, five minutes at least, to, to try out this challenge. Let's take a quick break now and start back again at quarter past. You'll have some time at quarter past as well to try this, this challenge. Okay, so uh, let's get stuck back in. Um, so we're looking at this challenge for the dictionaries. I'll just do, the, do a quick poll to see who's managed to um, complete it. Okay, the poll is up now. Okay, so a couple of people are still so um, <clears throat> trying the challenge. So it's um, we have a quick look. So it's uh, yes, yeah, simply printing out the dictionary to screen um, and then changing a value. So we already accessed a, a value in dictionary by giving it the, the the label that we want to use as a key, and then we can use the same way to access that to that element to set the value to change the value. If it already exists. Oh, and in fact, um, yeah, in fact, this example here. So, um, let's see. Well, I'll use the example that it gave just for consistency. So I'll just create that example that they had to start with. Um, so we can change an existing or access an existing label. Change an existing label. Um, uh, what? I've changed the um, the value. What we can also do is um, so remember with the list to add a new element to a list, we were using the append method. We're saying the name of the list dot append and then a new element. Um, now, if we want to add uh, a new key value pair to a dict, what we do is we um, index that. Uh, um, dict with a uh, a key that we that doesn't yet exist. So, um, for example, a third. Okay, that's yeah, that's actually something that was covered here in the documentation, but in the, in the, in the course materials. But we didn't actually didn't actually do that live. I didn't show you live. So, if we want to add a new element, we gave a new label that doesn't yet exist, set it to some value like uh, okay, whatever it is in this case, and now we can see that that is the way that we can add a new entry to a dict. So it's quite flexible. You can just um, Use that label and uh, as a key. It doesn't exist yet. Uh, it will add it. Okay, so that's uh, that's a dict. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, go on through to, to the final, I think, yeah, final bit of this episode, which is a uh, final bit of the kind of uh, basic building blocks, basic building blocks that'll be useful to to be comfortable with, familiar with, uh, to write your own code, um, and also recognize some of the behavior that that's going on uh, with. Um, code that you use later on, namely functions. So we talked about built-in functions, built-in methods, fun built-in functions like uh, length and type um, and print, and built-in methods like uh, append for a, a list, etc. So we can, of course, define our own, our own functions. And that's a big part of what you do when you write, especially uh, Python scripts that, uh, if you're automating a workflow, uh, what you typically want to do is you know, not just have one single monolith monolithic 
Python script that does everything in order, but the good way to program to, 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 to make things self-contained, to be able to test that self, little self-contained units of code give the right behavior for the right, uh, for the, for a given input uh, that they give the right output um, and to make it easier to debug and to reuse, to not duplicate code, etc. You want to define often your own functions uh, to do stuff. And the way to do that is to use the def keyword to define. So you def and then the name of a function, for example, function called add function. You simply call it add. I'll try that. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to specify that that function takes two input arguments. And note at this point, I'm not saying anything. Um, spa I mean, spacing internally is, is your flexibility there. Note, I'm not saying anything about what types those input arguments are, which will become relevant in a moment. In a moment. Uh, like Unlike other programming languages, one of the reasons that Python is so flexible is it doesn't require you to specify the types of things that much. It infers it, like we discussed. That can lead it to problems, um, as we'll see. Let's go on to define that function. So I just follow along to define something for yourself as well, whether it's this function or something very similar. Uh, so, uh, so you create a new variable called result, which is the result of adding A plus B. Again, we've not set up A and B are, so let's see what happens. And then we re return, uh, i.e. return is reserved keyword, says that when this function executes, um, it will output um, to wherever it was called, it will output um, the following, namely the result uh, variable. That completes my definition. It doesn't um, execute, so I pressed enter there a couple of times, it doesn't execute that function, it just completes the definition. So the definition of the function add is now stored uh, within is now active within my current uh, Python session. <clears throat> and you'll know if you have a Python script and you have functions you want to use, you should uh, define those functions, um, you know, typically at the top of your script or in any case, define it before um, you uh, try to use them because the way that the Python interpreter reads and executes, parses and executes your script is it simply goes from the top <laughs> and goes down. So uh, if it doesn't, if it hasn't come across the definition of a function before you try to use it in your code, in your script, it will complain saying, I don't know what you're talking about. So, um, so yeah, define it first and then use it, define your term. So uh, what happens if we use that? Uh, so we'll take the example in, in, on the left-hand side from the browser saying, uh, saying add, if you add numbers 20 and 22, um, oh, okay, and then print print the result, I could have just, I could have just said, just add, let's see, add directly the result. That's 42, okay, that's great. Um, so here's a question. Um, let's see if you can answer this without, well, without trying it. Well, if we, I can't, no, try it if you like. So uh, I'll ask, so um, what do you think will happen if, uh, feel free to just raise your hand um, or put it in the chat. What happens if you put um, two, 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 uh, what do you think will happen now? Anybody raise your hand and unmic yourself to, to say what you think will happen or put it in the chat? Yeah, concatenation. In other words, the result will be, output will be. We can try it. So yeah, like you said, it'll be the combination and concatenation of those two strings. Because of course, you might have had in mind when you wrote this function that you're going to be adding two numbers. And it certainly will add two numbers if you give it two numbers. But it will try to add any old objects that you pass it because there's no requirement within the definition of the function that those objects are of a particular type. So say I were to call this function with a number and a string, it's going to complain. So uh, that's something to, to keep in mind. So it might, in this case, it's a short function and it's easy to understand what's going on uh, and what caused the issue. But um, whereas in some other programming languages, you're forced 
by the definition of how the language works to define the type of the input argument when you define the input, when you define the function, you don't have to do so in Python. What can happen as a result is when you end up using that function or somebody else, not you, uses that function or your future self who forgot exactly what the details were of that function, then uh, it might fail in ways that are, or give the wrong result in ways that are not immediately obvious why. And that is because of this uh, flexibility of, of Python. Uh, so you could in principle put in additional checks you know in, in your safeguarding in your um within the definition of your function saying if at the very beginning if if uh, a is not a number and uh, or or b is not a number uh then 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 you know throw some kind of error or throw, uh, throw um complain okay so um that is the, some of the basic building blocks. So what have we, what have we covered? Um, we've covered um, sort of Python interpreter versus IPython interpreter. Um, we've mentioned Jupyter notebooks. Maybe you've, you've been using them. We talked about some of the basic primitive data types um, like int, string, float. We've talked about for different numbers and strings. And uh, we've talked about some of the primitive data structures like lists, tuples, and dicts. Um, so these you will use yourself, these data structures in your code, and also you will notice that a lot of things in in more uh, in other data structures, for example, data frames, pandas data frames, behave in different varying ways, behave like lists or behave like tuples or behave like dicts. Uh, in the latter case, especially if, if you're addressing, uh, if you're indexing uh, something by means of a label, it behaves a bit like, it can behave a bit like a dict. So understanding, being comfortable with dicts uh, will, be, will be useful. Okay, so let's continue now to um, the next session, which is about starting with data. So this is about actually, actually starting to use um, in this case, so we're going to use pandas, which is a, a very useful library for uh, uh, reading in and um, analyzing and sorting out um, tabular data. So uh, some, some initial explanation here. So we're going to start with using a data file. So if you have not already um, done so, this would be a good point <clears throat> at which to make sure that you have downloaded one of the files listed in, uh, in in documentation here. So the link is, is there. So um, the file in particular that you want is surveys.csv. Now if I open a separate terminal window, not Python, and have a look at <clears throat> that file using, for example, the less command uh, bash surveys.csv. I can see some of the structure of that file. So CSV stands for comma separated value, uh, as you, a lot of you will not be familiar with. So that means that um, there are a number of columns and for each row, the values in, in the column, uh, the values in that row are, are separated. Uh, columns are identified by the delimiter or separator of a comma. So uh, we have, so let's say we want to analyze that data um, in within Python. So these, as happens, are the uh, are the different kinds of data that we have. The, these are observations of animals uh, at particular geographical sites and different species, different genders, and also length of hind foot. Okay, so these all they all have feet, <laughs> um, and they all have a weight. So um, yeah, this is an example of what the output looks like. We just saw that. So pandas is a very useful library, uh, as you saw before, in order to be able to use anything that's not basic core Python, uh, but in a, a bit of, as part of the package, you need to first import that package. So what we'll start with, we'll start with importing that package, pandas. Uh, we won't stop there. We'll, we'll use this additional bit of syntax saying as pd. We can call it anything, and we don't need to call it as we don't need to we don't need to say as pd. Um, basically, the, all this is saying is import pandas. That's the thing we care about. And by the way, uh, do it, rename it as PD so that in our code we can type, instead of typing up pandas all the time, we can save a bit of time by typing PD when we are trying to use pandas functionality. So yeah, as it says here, every time, um, uh, yeah, <clears throat> we, we want to use pandas function, we can type PD dot the name of that function instead of pandas dot the name of that function. Okay. 
So the first step is to read in the data. Now, conveniently, Pandas provides a, uh, a function for uh, a built-in function for reading in uh, the data from a CSV file, and that function is called read CSV. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to say pd dot read underscore CSV, and it wants to take the path to that um, file as an input argument. Okay, so great. So that what does that look like? It looks like it's got it's showing us the 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 records the, the the columns that we expect. It's showing us the number of rows, and what it's actually done is it's shown us the first few rows and the final few rows, and it's told us at the end the shape essentially of this data. Uh, so 35,000 rows and nine columns. Now, um, as it is, this information has been output to the screen, which is nice for us to get an overview, but it's not very useful if we actually want to do anything with this data. So in order to do anything with this data, we want to allocate, the, assign this data to a variable so that we can manipulate it and, and do stuff with it. What kind of variable? Well, we can call, call it whatever we like, but let's see what kind of variable that is. We can do that two ways. We can either assign it and then check the type of the assignment, or we could check the, check the type of whatever the function call to read the data, whatever that outputs. So I'll do that. It tells us that what the read CSV command returns is a um, elaborate uh, long list called some blah, 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 pandas, part of pandas. But at the end, what it comes down to is a data frame data structure. So a data frame is uh, sort of one of the two core um, data structures in pandas. Um, the other is a, is a series, and the, and the panda series is basically a one-dimensional array of, of data. You could think like one of these, one of these column, um, one of those columns might be a series, and a data frame could be composed of multiple multiple panda series. Now let's let's assign that in data to a variable. We'll call it surveys, and just purely by convention, because because people tend to call it underscore df where df stands for data frame. Um, we've assigned that and we can check that the type of that variable is indeed the same uh, as a data frame. Okay. Um, and we can uh, print that out and we'll see the same, um, the same output. Um, it might look slightly different because this is saying if depending on the screen width uh, that you have, you might see something slightly different because the data might be it might be too narrow and some of it might be squashed. So it might look a bit like like this, like if I narrow my terminal window. But essentially, it should all be there. Um, so uh, yeah, it's showing us the first few rows and the last few rows. Um, if we want to get uh, a slightly uh, potentially slightly neater view of the data and just just show the first few rows only, we can use the the uh, built-in uh, method for data frame called head. Just like in, uh, you might be familiar with head and tail potentially as, as shell commands uh, in Linux. If not, fine, but you might. that's an easy way to remember if you are. So head and tail will work for data frames. So they print out just the first few values. Um, and then, yeah, okay, so that, that could be useful. In fact, tail, tail works as well, and we'll print out separately the first few values. So, um, okay, we just looked at this. An attribute that can be useful uh, to, to investigate when it comes to data frames is to understand, um, to understand what Python has done to, what Pandas has done to infer the uh, to, 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 to what, da what data types it's, as, uh, it's, as, it's assigned to the data that's been read in. Because clearly, um, when it reads in the data, it needs to make some decision about what uh, kind of object to use or kind of representation to use to store the data. Now, for each column, typically, it will have to make some, some intelligent decision about how to store this. So it, it parses and examines the data and uses some heuristic, some rule of thumb uh, to decide what sh it should be assigned. 
um, to store and to check, and it usually does sensible things, but to check what it's used to store your data and that to make sure that corresponds to how you intend to use your data, that in particular that it's the right kind of precision or the right kind of you know, um, type of data that you're going to be able to manipulate in the way you want to, you can check the dot d types, dot data types attribute, not a function call, not a method call because there's no brackets, it's just dot d types uh, on your data frame. So you can inspect that, interrogate that. And you'll see that it's it's assigned a lot of these as um, integers with 64-bit precision. You don't have to worry about that too much if you don't care about it, but it's um, that's what it's done. Um, for species ID, X, it's not specified. It's not thought of these as strings. It's just left a generic as object. Question from Manhala, how do we turn the CSV file into a data frame? Well, you didn't. Pandas did magically. So basically, the question is, it's a good question. And if you wanted to understand more, about what exactly it's doing, you could use the help. For example, so, we, so the function that we used, I'm just using my up arrow key here to get back to how we initially read in the data. The function we used was here, p pandas, abbreviated as pd, dot read csv. So we used the, the read csv function and we said to that function, okay, read the contents of this csv file. Now, um, maybe I would like to know what in general, how that function works. So I can do pd.readcsv, question mark, or I can do help brackets pd.readcsv. Let's see what happens. Okay. Uh, these are all, <laughs> you can see that this listing um, contains, first of all, what's called the signature means the signature of a function is basically the, if you define a function, the first top level line of that function definition which is the name of the function and the input arguments. Uh, that's, the, that's the signature. So here it's a lot of input arguments potentially. So there are a lot of options you can in principle give rather than, or in addition to just the location of the file, you can choose a lot of different options that will change how pandas reads in the CSV file. You would have to read into the documentation to understand what choices it's making by default. So for example, the, um, okay, yeah, we'll have a look in a second. So why you might be getting that error. So there, there's um, uh, the, when it's saying equal to, and then the green value, those are, those are default values that it takes. So uh, you're getting error that says surveys DF is not defined. Um, okay, that might be because possibly you didn't define it. So. This function call that I gave, uh, it will read in the, the data and output a data frame. We still need to um, assign that to a variable. So you, uh, it might be because you might not have executed this line. Okay, yeah, great. So that, that should define it. So let's see if uh, pd.readcsv um, we call help on that. It looks slightly different. You can still see all these input options here. Format is slightly different. Um, there's a link to a website where you can also read the information. So there's a lot of information here about how, you know, C talks about a parsing engine. So clearly there's a lot of stuff going on about how Pandas decides, you know, to how it reads in the data. Um, and if your if your separator or delimiter between columns in your data is not a comma, but some other um, uh, argument, some other uh, symbol, you can also specify that. So you can it, it it says the function name is read CSV, but it can be more flexible than just comma separated. It can be separated by other um, things, and you can you can make some choices um, when already when you um, when you use that function to. Uh, to pre-process or clean your data. For example, you know, when there are lines that are uh, bad, for example, a line that's too many fields, uh, so there's inconsistent uh, inconsistent uh, uh, row um, um, number of columns in some some cases, there are, there are things you can tell it to do with regards to converting, for example, when it encounters empty values or, you know, to set some default, default uh, values for empty values, uh, things you can do to say um, uh, when it gets a value that is not a number. Uh, for example, here, uh, let's see, 
what additional strings to recognize as not a number, i.e. something that's not a proper value, in, in case you have gotten your input data from some, some source that you know, stores it in lots of different ways. So there's already quite a lot of options here that if you are, you know, if you know your data, presumably you know your data, your data you can you can uh, modify um, and uh, use to already at the very first step when you ingest your data, um, ingest only what you care about and make sure that you deal with any um, uh, bad data in a way that is appropriate, that you're able to flag it later on and ignore it or do whatever you want to do. Um, right, okay. So, um, some more information about data frames. So, uh, it mentions that shape is a useful thing to, to see. So, we saw when we first read the CSV file, at the end of the listing, it printed out the shape. We can now explicitly access that from our variable. Uh, so if we ask for the, the shape attributes of our data frame, that gives us the number of rows and number of columns. And it's just, yeah, it's just a bit of explanation here again about methods and functions and how they differ. Okay, so uh, why don't you take a few minutes now to try this, this challenge on data frames. Okay, looks like most of you, <clears throat> if not all of you, have uh, managed to try that. So I'll start talking through the solution. <clears throat> so the um, this first one, the columns attribute, is something we've not, not looked at yet. But yeah, the columns attribute just gives you the names of the um, uh, the columns, <laughs> obviously. So um, something interesting here. So let's actually see that. Just to kind of highlight. Hmm, so yeah, what kind of what kind of a thing is that? It's not a list. It's something else. Okay, it's an index. So it's useful to be aware. You might think it's just a list, but no, it's some kind of special pandas object with a, an index, um, <clears throat> index of columns. So if we try to, uh, if we tried to, let's see, let's see, can we access the elements like that? Yes, there. It is an iterable thing, so we can access the the different column headings like this, which could be useful. Um, can we set? The, can we change the names of the columns? simply by changing a new name? No, apparently not. So an index does not support uh, being changed like that. There is, however, a, um, uh, uh, a function called, built-in function called, a uh, method, I should say, called rename, which can um, rename the columns to, um, to something else like uh, if you want to take the plot ID and rename that to plot ID, um, that should work. Yeah. So now plot underscore ID has been renamed to plot ID. So there are there are ways around it, but you might need to find a specialized function. Um, Surveys, okay, the shape, we already looked at the shape. Head, we looked at the head without any other arguments. Now you can give a number for that, uh, for that, for that function call, which uh, for the method call, which gives you the first however many lines you specify. If you give it loads of lines, then uh, <laughs> if you give it like a hundred lines, it will do the same similar thing to what it did initially when you just didn't say anything and you just asked for the data frame itself, which was print out the first five lines a break, and then the last five lines of however many lines in total, in this case, 100 you've requested. So, uh, and the tail, a similar behavior. Yeah. Okay, so let's continue. Um, okay, so now we can actually start to look at some statistics. Um, oh, actually, yeah, no, actually one, one more thing useful to understand a bit more about um, the contents of this data frame and what kind of the, what the information is in it. So, the data frame as a whole, we, we've just seen the data frame as a whole. Um, what well, we saw for the number of rows from it. So we've got these different columns. So let's say if we uh, see we can get one of these columns by asking, for example, the, the data in the 
what we were calling it a column with 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 the with the key the column name species id and i say key because it's, it behaves a bit like a dict right it's it's dicted it's addressable like a dict uh namely it's addressable with a with a label that acts like a key so what we get then is um uh the uh the values in that column but not just the values in the column we also get these uh indices which are actually the first the first column which which as you see in a data frame the very first column uh, it's explained here in the documentation on the left hand side but I didn't say in the very first column is is, a, is, a, is an index uh, which is not uh, itself uh, a, a, a labeled column with an, with an id so there are ways of accessing it and changing it but it just has these values and when you ask for the the, the data the data in the data frame that is uh, with a column id uh, with a given label it gives you the the data in the column and also the indice the corresponding indices tells you the name and tells you the length and what type of object and um the question is this 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 column that we've just output what what kind of an object is that actually if we were to assign that that to a variable if we if we were to say um species data equals the re result result of getting that index um Right, and what is the type of species data? That is a pandas series. So that's basically what I was saying, first of all, is that this data frame is composed of a number of pandas series. So pandas series is a more elementary object than a pandas data frame. It's basically a one-dimensional uh, array, essentially, with some additional information like index and uh, data type uh, and, and name. Uh, we can also ask what is um uh let's see uh so yes so if we ask uh for some other let's see um Oh yeah, I, thought, I think this comes later. Yeah, this comes later. That's useful too. Okay, yeah, this comes in a minute. So now let's actually look at uh, doing some, getting some insight into this data. So we've got this, I say raw data because we didn't specify any way of cleaning it or processing it as we took it in. We just gathered in, um, and then as, you, as you can already see, you'll see that there are some in some columns. You can see there are some NANs, some lots of numbers. So um, uh, we didn't do anything to those when we ingested the data. We just left them as is. And we could see those reflected in the um, in the original data. If we look, um, yeah, there are, for example, en empty empty lines here where you can see that there was no number for the there was no data for the weight. And so read CSV has uh, when it pandas ingested the data, it has it has uh, labeled those, converted those, and represented that as NANs, so that we can at least deal with those empty the missing data consistently, uh, and 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 do things to filter filter that. Um, Okay, so we um, looked at the columns and uh, there's a suggestion that if we want to, one of the questions we might want to ask is, okay, all the survey data, lots of information about species. If we simply want a canonical list of what species um, are present in the data. Now, if we ask for the, and this is what I was about to do earlier, if we ask for the, um, the data in the data frame corresponding to species id then we get all the elements we get the entire list of course that includes all occurrences of all um you know each each of these each of these rows is a is a is a record is a is a as a, somebody went out into the field or somehow <laughs> got captured some data about uh what kind of animal was, was present so but now what we want is we want a um unique a list of unique species we don't want all this re replication we just want a canonical list of what species were there period so pandas provides a convenient function for that uh, built-in method called unique. So if we say pandas.unique and we give it uh, a, um, well, let's see, we can certainly give it a, a date panda series. If we ask how does pd.unique work, um, let's see. So the parameters, so it takes an input argument values the values amongst which you want to find um, a unique re return a list of unique things and what kind of thing will it take in oh it will take in something that's one-dimensional and that's array like <laughs> that's a bit 
vague, but something that looks a bit like an array. Well, a panda series, as we just saw, looks a bit like an array. And indeed it works, this call on, on a panda series, like the one returned when we, when we ask it for the species ID. So, so now we have a, um, an array of, uh, you can see these species IDs. There's no ID that is replicated. No ID occurs more than once. So this we've extracted from our set of observations now, a canonical list of unique uh, species IDs. It's interesting also to ask uh, what kind of an object is this list? Is it a list? Well, no, the, there's something already here hinting at it. Um, you can ask what is the type of that? It is a NumPy, numpy.nd array. So NumPy arrays, although we've not started off by talking about them as primitive data structures today, are core to all of numerical computing you do with, with Python, um, either directly or when you use other packages like a data like pandas, because even in pandas series, a lot of the underlying data is is, is a NumPy array. So NumPy is a, a very important Python package, um, and it defines a data structure that um, should be used to store data, namely a NumPy array or ND array, and that is much better than lists for storing data and to, especially numerical data to work with because um, Unlike lists, which can be where the elements of which can be any of any type, for a NumPy array, you are forced by definition to specify what the data type of all the elements is, and it must therefore be the same for all elements. Um, so that means that the Python interpreter, when it does any kind of operation over a NumPy array, whether it's some kind of filtering, sorting, arithmetical operations, whatever. It doesn't need to do the constant checking, so it's a lot faster. And that's why all these packages are based on using NumPy arrays. So there's something to be aware of. Um, yeah, something to recognize. Okay, so time for you to try the next challenge on statistics, but it is now uh, 12 o'clock, which means we've come to uh, our lunch break. So uh, we will start again in back again in an hour at one o'clock, which uh, maybe will give you some time to start looking, to look at this challenge. And we'll start off, kick off at one o'clock again uh, by looking at this challenge. And then, and then afterwards we'll look at getting some more insight into our data.